Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Based in Fort Wayne, Indiana, we're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We're delighted to, today to speak with William Rivers Pitt, senior editor and lead columnist for the news organization Social Justice uh, pro that promotes social justice, Truth Out. Uh, if, you, if you don't subscribe to Truth Out already, you need to do that immediately. So, uh, Will, uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. This is, it's a pleasure to be here. So, Will, uh, um, high school English teacher, analyst for the Institute for Public Accuracy, press secretary for Dennis Kucinich uh, presidential campaign, now editor and columnist for Truth Out, a leading independent news source in pursuit of justice. It's fair to say you've given your life to the pursuit of truth. It's also fair to say that we've never had a president, and we've had some who hated the press, uh, who traffics in lies and conspiracies, vilifies the press on a daily basis, brandishing them as the enemy of the people, and worse, and who's cowed an entire party into submission to a false reality. So talk about, talk about how you see your personal calling. I mean, what is it that drives you, your own personal calling, especially in these days? Well, um, I've been doing it, uh, but within the next year or two, it's going to be uh, 20 years for me at Truth Out, which is kind of hard to believe sometimes. When it started, it was uh, four guys in a garage, basically, in the, the infancy of the sort of modern activist internet. Um, and it came out of the, 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 the Mark Ash was the one who originally <clears throat> began Truth Out, though he's no longer with the organization. But along with a lot of us, uh, Mark watched the catastrophe of the 2000 election um, and more to the point, watched as all of the major news services just glossed over the, the unbelievable chicanery and outright theft that was taking place with that uh, situation with the soothing mantra, this is, the, this is an orderly transition of power. This is an orderly transition of power. And uh, the, the initial point of truth out was to try to, as best as we could, we were a tiny little speck back in the day, was to try to burn through the, the high gloss of nonsense and misdirection and misinformation that you find in the mainstream news realm um, on a daily basis as best we could with the best reporting and best analysis that we could get our hands on. That idea over the course of the last 20 years has grown into uh, the organization that we have today. And the, the, uh, the number of things that I, I'm proud of in, in terms of uh, what Truth Out has become, uh, we could spend the whole interview talking about it. Uh, where, I, where I believe I believe we were the first uh, independent media organization to become a union shop um, which was a very big deal. Um, we are 100% donor uh, supported, which is in which if you've been paying attention over the last couple of three, few years to all of these progressive sites that were putting out great journalism, Splinter News, all of these wonderful organizations that were edgy right, and right out front with all of them getting obliterated because their economic model depended on a hedge fund or a corporation or someone that, or someone or something that would cut new staff, they would, they would, they, it's a, it, all of these organizations were treated like a, a pump and dump on, 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 on Wall Street. And it silenced a lot of really important voices. We have managed uh, to weather a number of, of, of storms, including the 2008 economic uh, calamity and the one we're currently enduring by holding true to that basic idea that we are beholden to our readers and we're not going to put ourselves into the hands of any advertiser or corporation that might uh, suddenly wake up and decide they don't want to deal with us anymore. Tell us about your shop. Tell us about uh, how many how many staff and you know just 
talk a little bit about Truth Out, Parth. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, we're a, we're a post office box in Sacramento, California. Um, our managing editor is in Chicago. Uh, we, one of our, one of our, our best and most beloved reporters is in Louisiana. We have uh, uh, one of the, the people who do uh, the, 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 the audiovisual stuff is down in South America. I'm here in the woods in, in New Hampshire. Uh, we're as virtual an office as you could possibly imagine. And there we've got a, we've got a couple dozen people on staff. Um, and it's, I mean, it's it, it, like anything else. It takes, it takes years to work out the wrinkles in a situation where nobody's, you can't walk down to somebody's office and, and hash out a problem. You have to be polite on the keyboard, which doesn't <laughs> naturally to most people, especially if they're heated up about something. Um, Maya Shenwa, our managing editor, is maybe the smartest person I've ever met. And I've only met her twice. <laughs> you know, we've worked together for a dozen years. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of the 21st century completely. Tell us about, um, it's not just about reporting the news. And it's not just about commentary. There's an end, right? There's a, there's a goal. This, this pursuit of justice. Talk about, talk about that as, as the ultimate end and the aim of Truth Out. If I were to give you the boilerplate uh, masthead, we are we are we are a long form and investigative journalist organization journalism organization seeking justice on matters of race, gender, the LBGT, LBGTQ community, uh, the environment. For until fairly recently, one of the most important people we had on staff was Dar Jamail, whose uh, climate dispatches. My God, yeah. We as an organization would both we would be simultaneously thrilled when they came in and spend the rest of the day hiding under the bed uh, because of the phenomenal work that he did. Uh, the end result is or the way the way that I like to think of truth out and it, it's a it's a, a reflection on the age. All of these people yelling and screaming about um, you know white you know, the Christians losing their rights and white people losing the country and all of this stuff. What is happening actually is that people who have spent over 400 years in this country in one form or another uh, being marginalized, silenced, and not outright brutalized and killed for who and what they are, are beginning to find a voice. It's not that anyone else is losing their equality, is that certain sections of the, of the society are beginning to gain theirs. And Truth Out is a megaphone for those voices, uh, and it's a, it's a privilege to be a part of it. Um, I like to think of myself as fairly studied in these things, but I, I reading truth out and working with the authors and going, you know, just doing the work that we do, I learn something new and astounding virtually every day. Let me ask you, um, um, I read, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I read that uh, Howard Zinn used to be a member of Truth Out's advisory board. I'd have to double check that. I believe that's true. I was going to ask you if you ever met Howard. I never got the chance. Uh, we do a lot of work with Noam Chomsky too. Okay, good. Well, I was going to ask you about I was going to ask you about both of them, but uh, uh, for a number of us, the Zen Education Project has been a resource for use in the classroom, and its motto aligns, I think, with Truth Outs. Its motto is building social justice, starting in the classroom. You mm -hmm. might you might say starting in the newsroom. Uh, well, yeah. go ahead. I just want you to comment on Chomsky and Howard Zinn and their their spirit alive in the work you do. No, it's, it's, it's one of the more, even, even after all these years, it's one of the more ridiculous uh, personal honors for me to look at the, the, the lineup newsletter for the day and see my name sitting next to Chomsky, sometimes in the lead, sometimes not in the lead. If I get the lead over Noam, I walk around like this for the rest <laughs> of the um, it, it is, the, the, I, I came, I came uh, to Truth Out after several years as a teacher and still uh, try quite often with, the, with the, the work that I do to approach it from an educational standpoint because among the myriad catastrophic problems facing uh, the country right now, uh, among the most serious is, an, uh, is, a, is a notable dearth of knowledge of basic civics and basic history. The idea that, I mean, I, people that I know who are dedicated activists, who, uh, who are just absolutely devoted to racial justice specifically, found themselves in the last week appalled both with themselves 
and with their country, uh, with, the, with the education that they received, that they didn't know the significance of Tulsa. Yeah. There were quite a lot of people out there who did not understand why holding a rally in Tulsa on Juneteenth, this president specifically, was such a stick in the eye to the black community. And then they went and I mean it's it's a it's a state it's a it's a it's a statement on huh, it's a statement on the state of things that the people in this country, the younger generation especially, best positioned to uh, to understand what Tulsa was were the people who watched the HBO series The Watchmen over the last couple of three years because the show opens with a dramatization of the Tulsa massacre. Uh, but I never learned about it in school that I can remember. You never, going back and reading about it, there was right. a concerted effort to scourge uh, the event from, I mean, it was taken out of newspapers. It, 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 <laughs> for the longest time, nobody knew what happened. And to a great degree, people still don't know what happened, which is where the educational angle of what we do at Truth Out is so important. And having people like Chomsky and Zinn, who are born teachers, uh, having them involved makes it all the more impactful and important. Bear with me here as I ask this next question. Um, um, I'm a retired religious studies uh, professor. And my thesis is that religion isn't so much about deities, but it's a, it's, it's a religion's a meaning making, identity formation, value reinforcing system. And so I'm especially interested in those places within culture that are all about this. For in my classes, culture and religion were virtually synonymous, not completely, but virtually synonymous. Uh, so I really appreciated your recent column on right-leaning sports talk radio. Mm. Uh, you introduce, uh, you, you indict the NFL and the NCAA. You speak positively about the U.S. women's national soccer team. You hailed athletes and coaches like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell, Greg Popovich, Venus Williams, and others. And this is how you describe the male pro sports culture, which I always studied as sort of a quasi-religious movement. But this is how you described it. The professional sports industry, most especially on the men's side of things, is in too many respects a toxic stew a violent hypermasculinity wrapped in government funded militaristic na nationalism. Now, see, I love that. Uh, but you're describing a religious movement there in, in, in my world. So, anyway, you don't have to talk in my language, but I want you to explain, flesh out for us what your point was in that article. Well, I mean, uh, half my family is from Alabama. And if you spend any time down south, you know that football oh, is a religion. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. My father went to Alabama, University of Alabama. Um, well, I mean, the NFL has been getting paid by the department by by the U.S. government for years now to do these extravagant flag waving uh, military flyover showcases that opened up a opened up a scene for uh, activists like Colin Kaepernick to take a knee and blow the whole thing up. Um, there's a. I mean, I you know I'm. You you make a you 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 put your finger right on it when you when you say that culture and religion are in many respects uh, conflated. Um, modern modern sports culture is very much uh, attuned to it's very they 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 poorly in my opinion try to have their cake and eat it too in terms of this is sports we don't do politics except here's the flag. And here's war weapons, and here's an anthem, and all of that is wildly political. And for great swaths of the country, you know, there are there are plenty of people who think that Jesus wrote the Constitution, or that more to the point, the people who wrote the Constitution were really leaning heavily on Jesus um, when they did it, which really couldn't be further from the truth. It was actually getting somebody's interpretation of Jesus out of their hair was a fair portion of the exercise. Um, but it's been an interesting, and I, I it, please, if this turns into a, a random tangent, uh, please forgive me, but 
I have been sitting back and trying to understand why now everybody saw little Tamir Rice get shot by a cop who didn't even get out of his car. Everybody saw I Can't Breathe the first time in 2014. Everybody has heard these names and seen these videos. And there, I mean, while the George Floyd video and it's eight minutes and 46 seconds is as a, it's a snuff film. And uh, with all of the horrors on top of it, but I have been sitting back and trying to think that can't be the fact that the, 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 the brutality of that, of that event and the capture of it on film and the, the viral spread of it. I just can't, there's gotta be more of a, of a, of a reason why now, why people in all 50 states, bigger and bigger and bigger by the day to the point that they nearly stormed the damn White House. Why now? And I read the other day a line about game theory uh, and the line was for real change to take place, a great many people have to change their behavior at the same time was the, was the line in that theory. And it struck me that back in March, a great many people changed their behavior very radically at the same time. They got themselves out of whatever ruts they were in. They were suddenly in a whole new headspace and a whole new uh, frame of mind. And I, I, I am no sociologist, but I wonder if that sudden, sudden collective change didn't lead to this larger collective change or uh, search for change that we're currently experiencing, bringing it back to the point you initially asked for, there is also the dearth of sports, the great distractors, the nationalist flag waving, get your head back to where it's supposed to be here in the Overton window where we're able to discuss from here to here and nothing else. That has been absent, that sort of present Rah Rah America, that is a subtext of every major sporting event and every major sports league uh, you're going to find, that has been curiously absent too. None of this discounts the years of labor that Black Lives Matter activists have undertaken uh, to bring us to this point. But I think that there are, there are little dots of light that have helped to lead us to what's taking place right now. And the absence of sports as a governing, indoctrinating, distracting body uh, probably has quite a bit to do with it. We don't do well without our sports or whatever, by another point, we do pretty damn good without our sports if given the right set of circumstances. You know, my two responses to you, you're, you're really onto something there, man. Uh, uh, if you think of sports as a catharsis, it, it, it's, it's a way for, for a society to act out its aggression uh, uh, vicariously. Yeah, I've always said that soccer was, a, especially in Europe, was a great uh, replacement for city states, city states sacking each other. You know, they just go for soccer <laughs> instead. You, you know, uh, you, what, what's the old what's the old saying? You know, I went to a, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. You know, um, sports as a catharsis for for group aggression or individual aggression. So without sports, I'm just wondering how that factors and so I think you're on to something there and the second thing is as somebody who was uh who taught um mathematics for uh, about 15 years at the high school level I had taken game theory and advanced game theory courses and you're also on to something there because what's one of the what's one of the functions of game theory they they try to quantify and they do this with with math mathematical precision they quantify critical mass and so when you started talking about you needed X number of people changing or, or transforming a worldview, that, that really is game, that is really how they game theory. Like, like for example, uh, there are people in the Pentagon who game theory how to, how, to mo how to get a critical mass of people in the society to support a war, uh, for example. And so quantifying critical mass you're on to something there too. So I, I, 
I'd recommend that you pursue those two lines of inquiry. I have, I have, and the other, the other element to it, not to continue to over, you know, overly continue this. There's a, a memory that I have from many years ago when I was in high school, I happened to be down in Florida visiting my grandparents and I was sitting out at, this was at night at the pool. And if you can imagine in your mind's eye, the ocean in front of you and a giant C-shaped apartment building surrounding where we were sitting with about six stories and all of them had windows facing out. And this was at night. And I was struck by the fact that virtually every window in the, in the, in the complex was all flickering at exactly the same time, because this was 25 years ago when we had four channels and there was nothing on three of them. And everybody was watching, whatever they were watching at that moment, everybody, was, everybody in the building was watching the exact same program and the light danced to whatever show that they were watching. Now, our, our media landscape is so utterly atomized that, you know, I, it would take me 10 lifetimes to catch up on all the awesome television I'm supposed to watch. <laughs> still serves as, I mean, not everybody, like, not everybody, I mean, it was uh, most everybody found out that John Lennon got shot because they were watching Monday Night Football. That's not the case anymore, but it's still, at least regionally speaking, is a unifying thing um, that, both, that both inspires in a, in a shallow way and distracts. You know, I'm a Boston sports fan. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't make any bones about it. It's my release. You know, it's my little mental vacation. Um, and wherever I go, whatever I do, in any part of the the larger New England area, if I'm in a room full of strangers and I start talking about sports, I've got ten friends. You know, just it, it's a it's a it's a it's a way that people connect with each other. Um, that again has been deprived over these last few months. Like you can only, if you listen to the talk radio stations, there's only so far that you can go with, boy, this sucks without sports. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're not gonna be talking about Boston sports because I see a Yankees fan on here and I'm a Cardinals fan. So uh, we're gonna move on to a different subject. Uh, Ron, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite our friend, Dr. Ron Caldwell to, to come in here. I know he wants to, he has a, a question for you. Uh, 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 so Ron, you want to take it away from here? Yeah, I was told I had to say something, so that's why Mike Mike is uh, Mike's going to keep the leash out. But um, I confessed uh, right when we were off camera that, and Will was talking about education. Um, yeah, I didn't hear about the uh, Black Wall Street and the Tulsa thing till probably two three years ago. But I said that, and, and almost many of us here on this call have been with Mike to Palestine, so we did talk about that. And I just said to Will that uh, at age 60, at the time when I went to Palestine in 2012, um, I, I thought I was well read, but I literally had not read anything by MLK until Mark Braverman's Fatal Embrace Palestine book kept quoting a letter from Birmingham jail. And then interestingly enough, so this is what I wanted to ask him about. Uh, it was April 4th, 2017, the 50th anniversary of the King's Beyond Vietnam speech. And there was a spate of articles about it. I'd never heard of it either. In a day, I guess a year to the day, he was murdered from that speech in Riverside Church. So. What he said basically, and I wanted to, add, I, I just wanted Will to comment. Here's one of the quotes from a few months later in August, but it's the same giant triplets he talks about. He says, We are now experiencing the coming to the surface of a triple prong sickness that has been lurking within our body politic from its very beginning. And here they are. The sickness of racism, excessive materialism, which I think you could call crony capitalism, and militarism, the plague of Western civilization. And tomorrow, William Barber, Poor People's Campaign, um, and Liz Theo Harris that Michael's interviewed, they add to those three triplets uh, climate catastrophe, and I think they call it not just white nationalism, Christian white nationalism. So they have. They've added two more. First, they added climate change. That was number four. So you can't call them the giant. I guess that'd be the giant quadruplets. And so, and I think they now add Christian white nationalism. So 
Um, what's your, uh, talk to us about that, please. Well, it, one of the things that we had talked about uh, while we were well, before the, the, the interview started was the, 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 the idea of people not reading the actual source material like letters from Birmingham jail because Martin Luther King is so present uh, in our culture on a surface level understanding uh, that very few people actually, people think that they already know him and they know what he's about and they know what he stands for. So they don't do the deep dive into the actual source material. Uh, it's also the, with, with, in respect to King, there's a good deal of his source material that isn't particularly championed by uh, US culture because um, if he had lived for, if he had lived the full span of his life, he would have probably almost certainly become one of the more eloquent uh, anti-capitalist activists um, that the country has ever seen. That was a, a huge part of his message was, uh, was socialist in nature. And he talks about materialism. You talk about crony capitalism. Uh, I believe my personal uh, worldview about, about the whole thing is uh, American, American style capitalism was born um, the first great American capitalist industry was slavery. And before anybody gets up on their box and starts pointing their finger correctly down south, um, I can point you right down the road from where I'm sitting to Manchester with those big old mills on the river. They got their cotton from somewhere. Uh, the, two, the two poles of that massively profitable enterprise were the Lords of the Lash and the Lords of the Loom. And it went from the south to the coffers of the north. And it was, it, it was, it, it is the, the reason why American style capitalism today is so disdainful of its employees, of basic worker protections, about wringing all the coppers that they can get from the labor of the, the, the pool of workers that they have dates all the way back to the establishment of slavery as the first great you know, in modern, in modern numbers, multi-billion dollar industries, everything, everything down to spreadsheets that, that people use every day in business now got their start in tracking the relative health and productivity of slaves in the field. Now, when you bring in war, war is the most profitable business of all. So it's in the same basket. Materialism, capitalism requires consumerism. And more to the point, it requires essentially a base of slave laborers. When we lost our taste for slavery in this country, we moved it overseas to places that we'll never see, uh, where people work for no money in execrable conditions so that we can go to Walmart and get stuff on the cheap. So it is all, it, it's, it's one big Christmas tree with a number of bulbs hanging off of it. The manner in which we go about running this economy uh, with the idea, I mean, it, 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 on a baseline, if you're going to, uh, the, uh, American capitalism has winners and losers. It's the only way it works. And American capitalism s understands this full well, but labors mightily through lobbyists and elected officials and every other manner that they can put their hands on <clears throat> up to and including indoctrinating an entire culture to think that their poverty and their lack of education and their poor food choices and their shabby health and their uh, inability to get proper health care is their fault. Um, comes down to we have winners and losers and there's no profit in taking care of the losers. So screw those people. Um, and if it has, if it, as bad as it was, as bad as it was, uh, during Martin Luther King's time, he still existed in a time where there was uh, a mostly white, but not all white, a mostly white middle class that could raise a family and put kids through college uh, working in a factory. The, 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 the unions were far stronger, the wages were more fair, and the overwhelming, uh, it, it labor, was, labor was still 
nose to nose with capital. Uh, after Reagan came along and all the dogs were let off the leash, capital took over and everything, it, but it all goes back. The basic idea of America and American capitalism, starting in those cotton fields in the South and the mills in the North is plunder. The whole point of the exercise coming over all, coming over that treacherous sea journey from Europe to the United States to this fresh new land was plunder. And it hasn't, that ethic has got great advertisers now to paint over the reality of it, but it hasn't changed a lick. The fundamental nature of American capitalism is plunder. And all plunder does is destroy. Ron, I, Ron, I want to give you a, a chance to follow up, but let, let me follow up quickly. Uh, and then, Ron, if you want to ask something else, you can pass it back to me. To follow up, Will, uh, with, with that, you know, the Poor People's Campaign has these five quintuplets now that they emphasize. But I think the power, the power of King with his giant triplets and the power of the Poor People's Campaign now is not just calling for different policies although critically and necessarily important. But they talk about the poor people's campaign as a call for moral revival because you can change policies, but really they're talking about, to use a, to use a spiritual term, they're talking about conversion. And a conversion can take place, you know, not only in spiritual terms, but in emotional, psychological, moral terms so say a word not only about how we talk about policy change, but also the need for a moral revival. Well, we, we touched on it a few minutes ago, talking about uh, people, the need for people to change their behavior, uh, a, lot, a great many people to change their behavior at the same time, um, and critical mass. I, I, I can't disagree with you that a, a, a moral revolution uh, is as important as the actual revolution. An actual revolution without a moral base is vandalism. You know, it's uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, we, we, you know, after uh, starting with Newt Gingrich in, in 94 and culminating with the rise of the Tea Party and the subsequent ascendancy of Donald Trump, we saw a revolution, a well-funded, amoral, not immoral, amoral revolution. No, that's right that sought to bring back, to, to put that, the ethos of plunder back on the hood ornament of the, of the national Cadillac, so, so, so to speak. Um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not nearly, I don't have, I don't have the beginnings of an, uh, the only way, the only way that I can think of to inspire the kind of moral change that we're talking about is through personal behavior. I mean, I don't know how you shake a nation so thoroughly ensorcelled with the concept of might makes right, uh, war is awesome, guns are even better. Um, you know, uh, Christian, Christian churches preaching hatred of their fellow people uh, in defiance of the only commandment that Jesus Christ ever gave. Uh, decades and decades and generations and generations and the economic uh, inequalities that have been a, that are part of the DNA of this country, uh, that and the, the the resentments and anger that get passed down uh, with mother's milk uh, because of that. I think of I think of uh, my my home city of Boston, which is rightly termed to be one of the most racist cities in the country. Um, that racism didn't just come down with the rain, uh, and it's not like uh, Irish people are, are particularly racist in their DNA, it came in no small part and in other industrial cities like Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, when the two waves of the uh, of black diaspora fleeing Jim Crow, you had, you, had the, you had all of the waves of immigrants coming over from Europe who started off on the bottom rung and eventually struggled their way into some semblance of economic stability. One came after the other, came after the other, and they were working for you know basically nothing, but they were they were they had work. And then comes this tide of humanity from the south, willing to work for absolutely nothing. Uh, and a lot of the people who had themselves struggled to get 
jobs in the factories and jobs wherever, lost those jobs to the cheaper labor because capitalism. So, you know, Sully from Southie doesn't like black people because his great, great, great grandfather lost his job on the assembly line. And that the hatred and resentment for that got passed down with mother's milk. It's economics, which is another way of saying it's American style capitalism. Yeah. Which is in of itself its own. We're talking about religion. It's the supply side uh, free market capitalists. They are, they are as Taliban as the Taliban about what they believe. I mean, it is, it is, almost, it is almost a dogma. You get, it, it, trying to get someone to wrap their mind around the fact that maybe this isn't the way to go is like trying to push molasses up a sandy hill. Yeah. Let me, uh, uh, Ron, did you want to follow up at all? I don't want to steal your thunder. Yeah, I got something. I got something that's on my phone, Will. I put this on my phone under a note. That's one of the first things that you wrote. One of the first things I think I discovered that you wrote because, like, for example, I've got an I've got an older sister-in-law that we don't talk to that's um, in Seattle that refers to the Occupy area as thugs and, and uh, calls everything liberal socialism. So here's something that, here's Will, here's vintage Will Pitt. On CNBC the day before, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin was on defending Donald Trump's State of the Union message. His economic program is working, said Mnuchin, we're not going back to socialism. Immediately, my mind, meaning Will's, my mind split in two and began talking over itself. Socialism? The right side asked in astonishment. How do we go back to socialism? Oh, wait, you guys think Obama was a socialist. That's pretty funny. The left side of my brain, however, rose in high dungeon. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the interstate highway system, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Hoover Dam, the GI Bill, the police, the fire department, public libraries, the post office, farm subsidies, WIC, SNAP, SSDI, student loans, public parks, and let's not forget top of line health benefits for public servants like the Treasury Secretary, all paid for with public money, it shouted, back to socialism. We've been wallowing in highly effective socialism for almost a hundred years, you mortgage pirate. That's <laughs> on my phone. So that if I ever, if anybody says something inane about socialism, this I got this right here that I, I'll send it all out to you, Mike. You can send it out to the bunch. The one, the it's, one, it's brilliant. I love that. I got it on my thanks. phone. Thank you. The one, the one, the short version of that that I like to catch people with is, uh, do you stop at stop signs? <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Public money for public good. Let's you know. Let's not the uh, Air Force and Marines, Coast Guard. Yeah. Let me let me let me ask you to make the the connection as direct as possible that you've been suggesting throughout our conversation. Th these names now have become everyday names in, in households, right? Brianna Taylor, Ahmad Arbery, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks. The long list of African Americans killed while killed sleeping, jogging, shopping, sleeping while black. Uh, and these uh, these murders raise all kinds of issues. Uh, uh, endemic to American society, two of which at least are interrelated systemic racism, and what you called the violence of the white supremacist police state. So I want you to talk more about, you know, we, we've been talking about race. I want you to talk about races, systemic racism, but connect that to the militarization now of the police. Well, geez, I mean, the... I mean, they're, they're you know, obviously they're interrelated, but... Say no, 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 I'm just, I'm the... the um... I'm, I'm, I, we kind of yeah. Well, we get into these we get into these conversations and we use the right phrases to describe the right things. But sometimes, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I do it. I do it virtually every day. Sometimes these things can be a shortcut to thinking, like the where like the phrase systemic racism. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, there's systemic racism. Well, what exactly does that mean? Um, how deep does it go, and how do you excise it? Um, uh, it, 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 it harkens back again to 
my my friend Sully from Southie, who doesn't like black people because his great 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 grandfather lost a job to a black man fleeing uh, Jim Crow in 1921. Yeah, you 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 excise those with slow and steady pressures. I I mean, I, I, it is about the only tonic that I can think of with the 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 the. the I, I am of the opinion that. Well, there is a great, this is one of the reasons why Truth Out exists. There is, a, there is a great, great love within the mainstream media to uh, describe this as a divided nation. We're a divided nation. And it's true insofar as if you think of the nation as a pizza and somebody takes out two slices of a 10 slice pizza that's a divided pizza, but it's still a lot of pizza over here, not a lot of pizza over there. <laughs> two, there are two things that I lean on when thinking about the state of this division that we're dealing with. I think it was Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham, who popped off a bunch of, in the, in the, in the heat of the Mueller investigation, who popped off about uh, Donald Trump deserves two more years as president because of all the time he's lost dealing with this non-scandal, blah, blah, blah. And Monmouth, I think it was, put out a poll asking, uh, do you think Donald Trump should get uh, two more years in office because of the time he spent dealing with the Mueller investigation? And 17% of the people who were asked said yes. Before you get down into the rabbit hole of what in God's name is wrong with that 17%, it's not a great big slice of the country. George W. Bush's Final approval poll on his last day of office taken by CBS News pegged his approval at 23%. Now, I am of the opinion that these Trump people, the Tea Party people, uh, and George W. Bush's people, they're all the same people. They got radicalized by eight years of a black president and found each other on the internet and went out and bought guns. But it's still the same, less than a quarter of the population. The problem that we as a nation face, and I'm evangelical about this, because you taught math, this is math. That 17 to 23% of the population will show up to vote on election day if it is raining live Jaguars outside. The same cannot be said for everybody else. In 2016, half the country stayed home. And all of a sudden, that 17 to 23% balloons up to an influence that's nearly 50%. And all they needed was a few people who couldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton, and here we are. We're not a divided nation. These are a relatively small portion of the population who are well-organized, well-funded, have their own nonstop media outlet in Fox News and now OANN. Um, and when 50% of the country doesn't show, they win. And that has been going on in election after election after election for 40, 50 years now. But I believe that by and large, the majority of this country, if you were to go into the bedrooms of basically everybody in the country and shake them awake in the middle of the night and say, do you want access to affordable health care? Uh, do you think police should be able to kill anyone they want? Uh, do you want your kid to go to a safe school? these basic bedrock, this is how we have a civilization ideas that we have to fight tooth and nail to even get a glimmer of and which are unfortunately, quote unquote, championed by a whole, a whole battalion of limp noodle, noodle Democrats in Congress who panic every time a Republican farts in the cloakroom. Um, On, with, the, with the giant cherry on top being the enormous amount of money that money spends to protect money by the, through advertising, through the news uh, outlets that they, that they own. Um, we're, we're, we, are, but we are a very hypnotized nation. And through a confluence of events over the course of the last couple of months, a terrifying pandemic that's got everybody at home, a lack of uh, easily, easily found distractions, probably quite a lot of people reading a lot more than they have before, and the murder 
of an unarmed black man by a police officer all kind of came together in this big thunderclap. And a great many people, I think, had a, a little bit of a long, dark tea time of the soul with themselves on what they believe and how they perceive the country that they live in. I mean, it's not, it's not everybody, but the polls that I see have 75% of the country backing the protesters. 60-something percent of the country thinks that we need to reconsider how we fund police officers. These are super majorities by any measure. And if the voter turnout, I have a dream to, to quote Martin Luther King, but my dream is a little bit more simple. I really do have a lot of faith in the core goodness of the majority of this country. And if we were to see two elections back to back, a general election followed by a midterm election, which nobody ever goes to the midterm elections, they're 30% turnout. And that's where the action is. That's where the house gets picked. A general election followed by a uh, a midterm election with 80% turnout. You would see a different country that January overnight. I'm not the world's biggest fan of Bill Clinton, but a line from his first inaugural has always stayed with me. There's nothing wrong with America that cannot be fixed with what is right with America. And people showing up to vote is what is right with America if it happens. These kind of people, uh, Robert Kennedy said that one fifth of the country is always angry about something. These people are always going to be with us. They always have been, and in their own way, whatever, they have their right to their opinions. But it is a majority rules country. You have to show up. Decisions are made by the ones who show up. And you cannot express in a, in a, in a, in a democracy this large and complex, you cannot express your moral outrage any more effectively than in a large turnout at the polling place. You can stand on the street corner with a sign. You can go to a protest that'll be there and gone the next day and has no force of law. The way to, the way to get a, to, the way to inspire a, a, a moral change in the country is to elect people who share your morals because we are a republic. You know, it's not a, it's it's not a it's not a pure democracy. We send these people up to do a job, and more we have and far too many people have been abdicating from that basic responsibility. And it's one of the main reasons why we are where we are. It opened the door for them to buy the thing, and then it just became a cascade failure. As long as we're talking about the election, let me uh, let me ask you two interrelated questions. Um, what's the legacy do you think of the Obama's Obama's uh, Obama presidency? And and talk to us about the sometimes heated discussion in the Democratic Party between the so-called mainline wing, Biden, Pelosi, I'd include Obama in that, with the more progressive wing, the squad, Bernie, and others, and the Demo and, and the primary process. So the Obama legacy and then this inner inner Democratic Party conversation, let's see, let's say it nicely. And, and where it's led in the primary process to the candidate we have today. It's a funny, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing to sit here and, and, and think about the answer to that question because after three years of this, <laughs> I, I, I would pay three months salary to have Barack Obama get on television and read his grocery list for five minutes a day just for some sort of soothing here's an articulate intelligent non-insane human being uh, speaking from a place of authority and things aren't going to catch on fire collapse or blow up uh, after he's after he's done saying whatever he has to say so I think the, 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 the legacy of Barack Obama is multifaceted. Um, the, the competence. Uh, now, there's good competence and there's bad competence, but competence, which is, can, be, uh, can be something of a Trojan horse. He came in on this whole, uh, this whole tide of, of change. Uh, and unfortunately, to no small degree, I mean, I look at the I look at what's going on in the Supreme Court right now with these decisions on DACA and the other day the decision on uh, transsexual employees 
Yeah, that's my next question. So I'm glad you're making that. I'm glad you're making that connection. Well, it, it, uh, it, it, everyone's going crazy. Oh my God, Justice Roberts is—he's a secret liberal. Gorsuch is David Souter returned. This is great. And I think, well, wait a minute. Capital is always more than willing to let steam off in various areas of culture and social, but it will always take care of capital. And the decision on whether the president has uh, is, is untouchable by the rule of law is still pending. And that's really that in row, the, 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 the choice decisions are really the big bananas uh, on the tree. Capital will always protect itself. And I think the change the, I mean, we, I think a lot of people thought a lot of things were going to change when Obama came into office. And the main change that actually happened was that for the first time in history, a black man was president of the United States, which is enormous change and incredibly important change. But uh, when he brought the worst people in Wall Street to come in and run his economic policy, uh, a lot of his military policy and uh, capital protected itself. Absolutely. So, by and large, I would say, uh, and the, the end of the, I was talking earlier about voting your morals to put people in office who share those morals. I think a lot of people invested a lot of hope in that guy. And uh, he, he came through here. He, 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 this is to say that it was a, a giant wasteland of opportunity, but it was a lot of wasted opportunities. It was a lot of, it was almost like a placeholder presidency in that. Uh, the, the, and, and a lot of act, a lot of progressive activists will say that you know, in, in a way, they would they prefer a guy like Trump to a guy like Obama because at least with Trump, there's no BS. You know what you're getting. You know, there's no there's no hiding it. Uh, a guy like Obama, on the other hand, brings in uh, <clears throat> brings in a raft of uh, a raft of rotten long term policies that. Um, go down, you know, the sugar makes the poison go down easier. So, I mean, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I adhere to that point of view, but I heard it articulated. Um, you, we have a, we have a, we have a friend in the, in the chat here. Yeah, that's okay. We'll get him off of there. Um, I told you they were coming. Yeah, that's okay. We'll get him off of there. I forget the second half of your question. Yeah, uh, about the uh, this inter this inter uh, uh, party uh, uh, conversation in the Democrat Party uh, in the primary contest between oh. the, main, the mainline part of the Democrats and the uh, and yes. the squad and Bernie and and where that's leading. My opinion, my thinking on this. Uh, and it's a it's a bit of a generational affair, which is a strange thing to say when you're dealing with somebody like Bernie Sanders, who is about the same age as Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, but he wasn't part of the sort of the democratic infrastructure um, that Pelosi and Schumer and a lot of these other sort of old, old long termers were. They were present in government when the old democratic coalition exploded and collapsed, when labor collapsed when the civil rights, when, when labor and civil rights and young people and all the rest of that dried up and blew away under the onslaught of the quote unquote Reagan revolution, they saw it happen and then they were stampeded by, you know, this was when people like Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld and John Bolton all came into their own and their, their single greatest power is their utter lack of shame. They are, it, it, is, it, is, it is telling that during this particular uh, uh, election cycle, the most lethal and lethally effective campaign commercials being put out by anyone are being put out by these anybody, never Trump or Republicans, who it should be noted, only dislike Trump because he's bad for the brand. Uh, you know, I followed David Frum into the water, but they're putting out extraordinarily brutal. The, the campaign commercial that, that featured uh, yeah, Lindsey Graham praising, calling Trump crazy and praising uh, Joe Biden in his own words was one of the most, it, it, one of the most excellent things I've ever seen. And of course it came from a Republican media tank because they're so much better at this than we've ever been. 
Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are products of that environment. They seem as of, I think if you want to, if you want to talk about the main difference between the progressive wing, which is for the most part younger, and the and the the standard bearers for the party establishment, who are for the most part older, is that I think that the older the 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 the, the establishment has PTSD after dealing with these people for so long um, and being just terrified of their own shadows. The the first the the, the first thought out of their mouths is always, well, what are the Republicans going to say about this? Uh, it, it, where I think the 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 progressive wing, they 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 don't. And they, they, they just, they always seem to act as if, if we do this, then they'll be nice to us. If we do this, then they'll give us what we're looking for. If we do this, then we can all be friends. They don't seem to have a proper appreciation for who they're dealing with. Uh, and I think that the progressive wing of the party has a much more clear-eyed idea of the no small degree monstrous nature of a lot of the people that they are dealing with. Uh, so there's a. Good. Um, talk a little bit about uh, your free ebook version on, um, you've, got a, you've got an ebook on police violence. And I wanted you to, it's been downloaded 80,000 times from what I've read. Give a, give a commercial, give a commercial on uh, your ebook on police violence. I would be happy to. This is this was actually a product that I myself was not uh, was not involved with, but the Maya Shenmar, who I had mentioned earlier, and a number of the of the reporters on our staff are deeply devoted to the idea of police and prison reform, and uh, have spent years uh, working on it. Maya has written a, a couple of very very important books on the topic, and we put. Uh, they, they put this uh, collection of various uh, long form bits of journalism together into this ebook. And then after everything happened with, uh, with, with, with in Minneapolis with George Floyd and, and, and all the rest of it, it seemed prudent to uh, give it away for free. So we, we've been putting it out there uh, free of charge for people to come and just again, getting back to this, uh, educate themselves on there's a, there, 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 there's a lot of inertia behind the way people look at the world. And a lot of people will approach things from the context of, well, it's, it's like this, so it's always been like this. And to fail to appreciate the, the, the slow creep of things like the, 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 the penal industrial complex, which has its own lobby in Congress. Um, you had talked about the militarization of the police and Again, we come back to economics. Um, all of these tanks and this armor and this weaponry that was given to these police departments for free by the Department of Defense, it, it begs the question, why, <laughs> why do they have so much surplus war material that they can give this stuff to free to police departments who can't afford to train their, their officers on the proper use of this stuff? So you get if, yeah. if you've ever if you've ever dressed up for Halloween, you know that putting on a costume changes your demeanor. It, you you sort of become the person that that you're dressed as. You're either Dracula or I was Braveheart one year, and you know it, it, any kid can tell you that they turn into whatever it is that they're dressed in. A uniform will do that. And you take a, a police officer out of his standard blues and you put him in armor, and you give him a, a, a weapon of war, and you put a helmet on his head and you make him well nigh indestructible, you dress him up like a soldier, he's gonna act like a soldier. Soldiers have a very different purview than police officers. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Ron, I saw your hand up. I'm gonna to come to you in just a second. Will, when we talk about the militarization of the police, you know, in the police state, uh, especially a racist police state, white supremacist police state, uh, as you called it, we here at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, um, note, uh, along with other Palestinian rights activists around the country, we we note the uh, the similarity uh, with the kind of tactics that are used in Israel against Palestinians, and as I'm sure you're no doubt aware, um, the uh, the exchange programs 
between US police departments and the Israeli military, with Israel providing surveillance techniques, training, and deadliest of all, uh, the militarization of policing culture in US cities. And so uh, um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've done any research in that regard. Well, I mean, not, nothing that would that would that would qualify as scholarship. I am all too aware that um, I mean, you're dealing with a, a nation like Israel who has a, a captive population uh, uh, of Palestinians who police that population as if they're an enemy that could attack at any time. Um, that mindset has been ported over. Uh, through those training exchanges and through, you know, plain old American racism. You know, we don't need Israel to tell us how to, how to smack around our, 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 our minority population. We've been doing it for more than 400 years. The police in the United States began as uh, Second Amendment well-regulated militias uh, up north uh, to come running when the British were coming and down south to defend the white population from slave uprisings. You know, it's, uh, inter it's interesting. Israel in, in, its, in its materials even talks about uh, Americans' treatment of African-American people and America's treatment of the indigenous Native American population as models for its own racist police state. And so it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. America's history, Israel's history, they're both racist police states. And uh, uh, anyway, Ron, you wanted to jump in here and then we're gonna wrap it up. No, I was just resting my hand and you saw it with my virtual background. It looked like I had my hand up. No, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation. All righty. Well, I'm, I'm gonna let Will have the, I'm gonna let Will have the, let. Tom, did you, uh, well, anyway, Tom, did you wanna say something? Why don't you hit your space bar uh, yeah, go ahead. There we go. Yeah, I, I have a quick one for you. Having uh, just seen this special the other night on PBS about the uh, Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. uh, and having lived through that area, remember, well, I think it was it Huey Newton, Newton or Rap Brown that said, violence is as American as, it was either apple or cherry pie. I can't remember which one. Mm -hmm. That phrase stuck in my mind for perhaps a half century to round it out. Um, I'm a bit surprised there hasn't been more of a radical, and I'm not, advocating and I'm just surprised historically there hasn't been a more more of a radical element in the minority populations in the U.S. and generally or whatever non-white group you might be talking about it hasn't arisen I keep thinking it may happen I mean admittedly uh, we're not to the point yet that those individuals constitute uh, as the I actually, I can't help but think of a Time magazine, uh, pardon me, a, uh, a National Geographic a few months ago that said, the dawn of the white minority. So we're at the dawn of the white minority, and I guess we think we already have the white minority if you look at, what, people under age 15 or 20. So I'm a bit surprised that hasn't happened. Uh, is anybody here, are you aware, uh, Bill, or, or is anybody else aware of any strong push among those minorities who've been constantly abused to become violent in an organized manner? Well, I know, and I'm, I, I, am, I am hard put to put my finger on exactly where I wanna say Minneapolis, but it might not have been. But within the last couple of three months, there was one news story and the excellent publication, The Root, if you wanna do a search for it, you can find it. Mm -hmm. Um, there were protesters who were getting menaced by these gun-toting uh, white supremacist types. Yeah, and, uh, a group of of heavily armed black protesters came out to stand beside the protesters hmm. while they were um, wow. while they were doing their thing. And it's interesting that you bring that you, you make this point because I remember thinking how notable it was that I hadn't heard of any other similar instances taking place anywhere in the country, it was notable for its rarity. And I am certainly, um, you know, swaddled in, my, swaddled in my white privilege and not a sociologist and can only hazard a guess, but I 
in the, the totality of the violence that is both both verbal, uh, implied, and actual brought against black people in this country is so complete that if if I I just I believe that if I were a militant black man who was incredibly pissed off about everything that was going on and I had a gun and I had some friends who were of like mind, I would still have I would still be given great pause before even doing something uh, uh, like walking down the street in an organized fashion with me and my weapons. Because in this country, I mean, it takes a special kind of person to volunteer for a suicide mission. And in this country, with such deeply seated racism, not only within the police department, but within a segment of the population that has armed itself to the teeth, you're, volunteer, you're potentially volunteering for a bloodbath. Now, I understand, the, I, I, I can't even begin to understand the rage. I understand my not understanding it, but I think it would, it, it, it would take a very brave group of people to put together that kind of a show of strength because they are inviting calamity. I mean, that kind of, that kind of in-your-face pushback um, Parts in certain parts of this country is, is, is begging for the kind of violent response that we haven't seen since Tulsa, put it that way. Thanks for that, Tom, and thanks, Will. Um, I'm gonna draw things to a close here. Uh, so William Rivers Pitt, uh, thank you for joining us today. Any parting words for us? Just what a privilege this was to, to be here. These were, I mean, I am, uh, I am, you know, obviously, used to talking to the keyboard and when I do whenever I do an interview of any kind of interactive thing it's usually 10 minutes on the phone like this is everything all at once and this you know it's it's about as effective as you know hitting a speed bump this is uh this is the kind of conversation that that needs to be happening more often uh as widely as possible and I really appreciate you uh bringing me on to make a part of it um read truth out send us a couple of bucks if you if you can that would be awesome uh, we, uh, we work for you.